Hello, everyone. So before we start, I just want to mention that in the last lecture, I was kind of disconnected for about five minutes or 10 minutes. So uh, I was just talking where you guys were not able to hear it. So uh, if that happens, just please um, write something in the uh, chat because I'm actually connecting uh, to this room using two uh, computers. So I'm still able to see that uh, even though my uh, laptop is uh, disconnected. Okay. So today we are going to finish our lecture eight, uh, which is the transfer learning and the CNN case studies. In the, so in the last lecture, we uh, learned about the transfer learning. And today um, we'll uh, see, uh, look at some um, seminar uh, CNN uh, models, which was uh, uh, which was the winner of the uh, ImageNet large scale video, uh, uh, the image classification uh, uh, workshops um, for the last 10 years. So before we start, I have a lot of announcements today. So uh, first of all, the project team is team assignment is done. So you guys should know that which team you're going to work together. And uh, the project already started. You, you, uh, do uh, whatever you proposed. And uh, I will, uh, I'm planning to um, give you some short presentation about what we are going to expect for the midterm reports. Uh, if we have enough time after this lecture, I will do that. That would take just five or 10 minutes. If we don't have enough time, I will um, take a video and we'll upload it to ETR. So uh, let's see. So uh, that's it. And for the project, you can request a uh, GPU server account, especially if you don't have that uh, access to some uh, large amount of computing resources. So uh, the TA will post um, some announcement about how to request the, the server account. And you're going to uh, use that account for your project for this course, okay? And the midterm is uh, currently scheduled on uh, the Monday, two weeks later, um, 25th of October. Uh, it will be in the same time of our class uh, from 11 to um, 12.15. And um, it will be offline. So unless we have any new news about like um, uh, more uh, res uh, restrictions on gathering, we are going to have the offline meeting for this uh, midterm. So you guys need to come to the GSDS building, uh, building uh, 942. And you guys will be split into two rooms or three rooms. Uh, currently, we are planning to split to three rooms, two large classrooms and one more smaller meeting room. So uh, most of you will be seated in uh, 301 or 302. So be sh uh, make sure that uh, where, your, uh, where our building is and uh, please come to the class uh, not to be late. And on the exam, we'll be covering the lecture one to 10, uh, which we are going to finish before um, the, the exam. And um, the reading materials I uploaded and the papers I linked in the, on the website are all included. So you have to read those and we are going to have specific questions uh, in those papers and the reading materials. But the papers linked only in the slides, not in the websites, are not directly included. So you're not required to read those papers, but uh, I strongly encourage, but it's not, uh, will be asked directly within those papers. And uh, I plan to release the lecture recordings uh, uh, publicly uh, to help you guys to prepare the uh, midterm. So I I'm gonna post that sometime soon, okay? And homework two will be out today. Uh, and the due date will be uh, Friday of the week of midterm. So uh, if I give just two weeks strictly, that will be like Wednesday, but uh, that is right after the midterm. So I'm giving two more days. So that's it. And if you have any questions, please ask me now. Everything is good? Okay, then uh, let's do some review questions as usual. I'm hearing some sound from someone. Can you guys mute? Okay, 
Uh, okay, let me ask one question to um, Jungkyu, Lee Jungkyu. Are you here? Okay, uh, then Yejin, Hang Yejin. Yes. Yes, uh, in the last lecture, we learned about batch normalization. Can you just briefly explain what it is? Um, batch normalization is to normalize the data um, by each batch. So, um, this has an effect of preventing um, overfitting, and it works as a tool of regularization. Okay, so yeah, thanks for your answer. So yeah, uh, she explained about the uh, batch norm. So we um, explained why do we want to have the zero mean and unit variance in the input layer, but uh, in the input layer, we can just uh, tweak the input itself to normalize the inputs. But uh, what about the in the intermediate layers? Uh, how can we do that? So we uh, the batch normalization was uh, intended for actually normalizing the intermediate results and compute the gradients, and then it recovers the original range to make our uh, learning process more efficient and more uh, robust. So there's actually a lot of advantages, as Yejin said. Um, we, uh, the model uh, converges quicker, and uh, it also has some effect of regularizations and, and more. So uh, it's usually recommended to insert the uh, batch normalization in the middle of your network. And these days, uh, some other normalizations like layer norm or instance norms, they are also useful. So uh, you may refer to those papers, and you may use some of them uh, in your project, in your network. So. That was what we covered. And actually, we have a question from a student. Let me quickly cover that first. Which materials can we bring to the midterm? Uh, it's closed book exam. So you're not going to bring anything, anything but your pencil or pen. Uh, some questions might require some elementary school uh, math, but I expect that you can do that without a uh, calculator. If uh, it's too hard for you, maybe you can just write the formula on me. And if that's correct, I'm going to give you the full credit. OK? Cool. Any other question about the exam? <laughs> OK. Uh, next question. Um, the data science. Yunsop, Yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, in the last lecture, in the uh, lecture eight, we learned about transfer learning. What is transfer learning? Uh, in general, if we uh, uh, we use a pre-training date, a pre-training model, and train. Uh, entire model on a specific data set. Yeah, you mentioned pre-training. So what is pre-training? Uh, can I ask it Korean? Yeah, OK. I'm sorry, Korean. Uh, 기존에 uh, 만들어진 uh, 모델을 이용해서 제가 갖고 있는 어떤 데이터에 적용해서 학습을 하는 거를 프리트레이닝이라고 합니다. Okay, so what he said is uh, using some pre-trained model on some other data sets to initialize a model, and then we are going to train on the target data. So that's correct. So why do we do that? So um, usually we may be able to find some much larger and more general uh, data set, then we can train on that data set first to um, initialize our model. And then 
we have a smaller but uh, our uh, slightly different target data set, then we can fine tune our model uh, starting from the initialized, uh, from the pre-trained model. So in that way, we can uh, transfer some knowledge that we uh, the, the model learns from the uh, larger data set. And if those two data sets are similar, then uh, actually the performance is uh, significantly improves with the pre-training. So uh, you usually, um, consider using the pre-training if you can find some similar and larger and more general data sets. So uh, that will be probably very useful for your uh, many of your projects. And you may be able to find some uh, pre-trained image models or video models on, uh, on the web. So I showed some links. And I strongly encourage you to explore those pre-trained models to initialize your model for faster training. OK, so that's it for the review. And today. We are going to uh, see some case studies of the convolutional neural nets, uh, historically uh, important. So in the, the ImageNet challenge was started around 2010. And at the beginning, uh, the uh, winners were like shallow models. And they were uh, performing like, um, like this. So about 72 to 75% of uh, accuracy, which means for every four questions that uh, uh, classified images incorrectly, which was not as good as we expect. In 2012, which was the AD1, we uh, had a very novel model uh, using eight layers, which is uh, much deeper than the previous neural net based models. And it achieved like 16% of the error rates, which is about 10% better than the previous year, which was kind of revolution, start of the revolution. So uh, at the beginning, we are going to start learning about this uh, model. This was uh, written by Alex. His first name is Alex, and so it's called AlexNet. And in the next next year, uh, another two guys uh, just revised this model slightly, and they achieved like 5% better results. So these two models are very similar to each other, and we are going to cover this uh, as our first uh, case study in this lecture. So here's the architecture of the AlexNet. So, um, First of all, it's uh, we have the two different uh, two same things in parallel, but they are actually logically they uh, need to be concatenated to each other because just the upper and lower layers are identical in architecture, and they are just distributed to two hardware GPUs. So uh, that's just for um, more um, faster uh, training. But logically, actually, they have, for example, for this layer, they had. 48 and 48, so total 96 uh, channels. And here, 128, 128, which means they ha actually have 256 layer, uh, the channels and so on. So let's see layer by layer. So from the given image of size 224 by 224, they applied convolution layer first, followed by a pooling layer. We, we learned about this in lecture five. And then they have some normalization layer to normalize the embeddings. And then they repeat this, this, the same set, another convolution, another pooling, and another normalization, and followed by three in a row convolution layers, and then one pooling. That's here. And then they applied um, two layers of fully connected layers, which was size was like 4,096. And after that, they map uh, to the, the uh, class course. So this data set has 1,000 classes. So uh, eventually, they output 1,000 scores for uh, corresponding to each, uh, each class. And then followed by softmax, and they uh, compute, uh, compare with the, uh, the ground truth one-hot encodings. Something like that. So let's see some more details here. The very first layer. So this is the convolutional one, convolution one layer. So input is 224 times 224 times three channels, RGB. And at the convolution one layer, uh, they applied uh, 11 times 11 filters, which is 96 of them. And they applied a stride of four. So we, uh, you should be familiar with these things now. Uh, the filter size, number of filters, and the stride. And they didn't mention about the padding here. So what would be the output size? Do you remember this? Probably you remember this formula. So let me ask this to 
어, 상윤, 배상윤. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What would be the alpha size? Um, uh, the alpha size is, wait, I have to calculate. Mm -hmm. uh, Can you do that quickly? <laughs> 55. 55? How did you get that? What is the W here? Uh, 224. Yes, and what is F? F is 11. Yes, and, and P, P, is, P? Uh, is the channel number three, right? No, P is the padding. And I didn't oh. mention about the padding here. So let's assume that that's zero. Yeah. And what is the S? S is stride. So it's four. Yeah, four. Right? So divide so if by we compute five, that, yeah. we do have this 54.25, which is weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sang Yun. Yeah, so uh, this is one of the mystery that is not known in this computer vision community. But uh, according to the paper, they applied this. And uh, they should get this weird number as the, the alpha size. But in the paper, they say that the alpha size is 55 here, right? So people guess that they has just uh, padded three additional pixels to this image, but they didn't explicitly mention in the paper. So that's what other people just guess, but uh, it's unknown. It's kind of just one mystery in, in, in this area, but that's what we just guessed. They probably have resized the uh, image to uh, 227, or they've just padded zeros uh, to three, but uh, that's also weird because uh, the padded size on the top left may be different to uh, right bottom. So maybe one, two, or just zero, three, or something. But uh, yeah, that's um, their alpha size. So their alpha size is 55 uh, because it's written here in the in the in the picture. So uh, after the convolution one, they have the uh, 55 by 55 times number of channels which was 96. So the alpha size should be this, 55 times 55 times 96. If you don't follow this, please review the materials in lecture five. We have discussed uh, how we calculate this, uh, the alpha size from the convert convolution layer. And this will be an important part of the midterm. So please review this if you're not familiar with this. And what is the total number of parameters? Let me ask this to Jaewon, Kim Jaewon. Hi, Professor. Uh, yeah. Uh, parameter number is uh, like three times 11 times 11 times 96. Mm -hmm. You forgot the uh, bias. Uh, bias, yeah. Yeah. So with bias, the yeah, your answer is correct. 11 times 11 is the uh, the filter size, right? And each of them we have multiplied with the channel size automatically, as we discussed in uh, lecture five. So the input is uh, three channels. So 11 times 11 times three, and we have uh, one bias term for each input channel. And with times, we compute 96 output channels. So this is the number of channels we compute from here. Everything is okay? So this is how we interpret this uh, AlexNet model. So uh, okay, wait a minute. So we uh, this picture actually includes all of this information. This is the input image size, and this this shows the um, filter size, and uh, the number of channels output uh, is written here, and then it computes the uh, entire output size, which is fifty five, written here, and then we apply. Um, uh, stride of four here. So every, everything is written in this uh, figure. And actually, you can do the same exercise for the next layers. Jumbom, do you have any question? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the number of parameters. Uh, then uh, I was always curious about the number of the bias, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. You assume that uh, there is um, bias uh, 
um, yeah, you assume that we have bias, but uh, do we have to consider bias uh, whether or not uh, the condition is given or not? So we always yeah. give some capacity yeah. to consider the bias, and we yeah. don't know if, it, if we have strong bias or not in the data, right? Yeah. So if the data doesn't have any bias, then that uh, bias term will be fit to zero or close to zero. So we yeah. don't need to worry about that. You just give the capacity and just let the data to fit it. Uh, yeah, uh, it is actually a question about the midterm exam. <laughs> yeah. Just, ah, uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, please, yeah, consider the bias always. And yeah. uh, if you just miss the bias term, probably you will get a, a partial credit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that was actually a good question because uh, sometimes we are going to just ignore the bias term uh, because we are interested in just rough number of the parameters. And if you just uh, skip this plus one, then you will still have very similar number. So in some of the analysis we are going to have today, we uh, may ignore the bias terms. So that's a good question. Let's see the next uh, layer, which is the pooling layer. So after the convolution, they apply the pooling layer. And the input is 55 times 55 times 96, as we calculated now. And they say that they applied uh, three by three filters as tried two. So what would be the output size here? Uh, Yerim, Kim Yerim? Yes. Yes, can you compute the output size here? Seven by twenty-seven by ninety-six. Okay, let's see. Yeah. So the, the input size is fifty-five, and the filter size was three, and divided by the try size is two. So uh, she got twenty-seven correctly, and yeah, the ninety-six. The channel size doesn't change at the pooling layer. So great job, Yuri. What is the total number of parameters? Uh, let's see, Suyeon, Park Suyeon? Yes. Yeah. What is the total number of parameters here? Um, it's zero. Yes, why? It's, there is no training in the pooling layer. Yeah, great job. So at the pooling layer, we don't learn anything. So the number of parameters is zero, OK? Okay, so we just uh, looked at the convolution layer one and pooling layer one, what's happening there. And I'm going to uh, give you just two minutes uh, because we don't have enough time. So please fill the input and output size here using the information I gave here. So what we did uh, is until here. Uh, and we, you can actually compute all the input and output sizes uh, in the remaining layers. Uh, okay, Kim Jin, do you have any question? You are muted. Hello, yeah. Professor. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about the the parameter size in the previous page. Okay. It's, uh, uh, so as long as I know, uh, pooling layer doesn't really have the parameters. Mm -hmm. And output size is always hopped, but is there any uh, specific reason why we uh, the the output size is calculated by that uh, uh, formula thing? Because I um, yeah, we we uh, discussed about that in lecture five, so. Yeah, I would like to ask you to review the materials in lecture five. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. Yes, which one? Professor, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the midterm exam and during this break time. So, uh, 
I, I think I saw a post saying that I mean, Korean and Korean and English are both are you know, okay, except the final uh, paper. So, so is it permissible for us to write in Korean in our midterm exam? Or yes, yes, it's okay. You can answer in Korean in the exam. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, because we don't have enough time, uh, if you haven't done yet, uh, I strongly encourage you to do this by yourself, and um, that will be a good, great exercise for your midterm preparation. So here's the answer. Um, so yeah, check it, check your uh, what you computed and uh, to the answers, and if you have any anything incorrect, please try to understand what's happening there. And if you still uh, doubt. Uh, incorrect, then let me know. My calculation might be incorrect, actually. So, okay. So eventually, they have the alpha size of six by six by the number of channels, and then all of these are fully connected to four thousand nodes, uh, with two layers, and then they are mapped to one thousand scores. It's this is AlexNet full architecture. And here are some details. So you don't have to memorize all of these, but I just listed this because uh, you should know what all of these actually mean. So in the paper, they just mentioned that, for example, um, they used uh, normalization layers, and, uh, and they actually used heavy data augmentation on the fly. So you know now what is data augmentation, and you should be able to understand what these means. Image translation or horizontal reflection, they applied these data augmentations for what purpose? We have already discussed what uh, it, what, what is that. Dropout, they applied 0.5. So now you should understand what this means. Each of these edges in the in the in the architecture was randomly removed when they trained this model for 50% ratio, right? Batch size was 128, uh, which you should know as well. When you train the model, uh, they use 128 examples at the same time to compute the gradients. And they used stochastic gradient distance plus momentum. We dis, uh, discussed about these in lecture six, right? So uh, this 0.9 is the, the ratio uh, of the weight decay. So you should remember this. And we also learned about learning rate scheduling, right? So initial learning rate was specified this number, and they reduced uh, to 10% manually when the validation accuracy plateaus. So we discussed about uh, these strategies in lecture six or seven. So this, these are just examples of uh, how they train their model. And uh, now you should be able to understand what they mean. OK? So they uh, actually used, uh, first uh, for the first time, the CNN models. And they were winner of this uh, ImageNet challenge in 2012. And they first used the uh, ReLU activation functions and uh, all of these things. So uh, this is kind of uh, one of the most popular uh, convolutional neural nets um, about 10, 10 years ago. And in the next year, uh, another guy used a uh, very similar architecture. So here, um, the network name was named after the first letter of the, the authors, ZNF. So we call it the ZFNet. And given the same size image, these are the, the image size in the ImageNet data set, they applied, uh, for example, 7 by 7 with stride 2 instead of 11 by 11 with stride 4. And then uh, they actually did very similar networks. Like in the layer 1, uh, they applied conv and then uh, max pooling. In the layer 2, they applied another conv and the max pooling. And 3, uh, convolution in a row, and then applied one max pooling at layer 5. And they have the same size of the, the fully connected layers in layer six and seven, and then maps to softmax. So very similar architecture, but just these numbers are different. And then they uh, reduce the error from 16% to 11%. This is amazing because uh, just 5% improvements, but uh, the, the, uh, the amount of incorrect answers was like, dropped by like 30%, which is amazing. Uh, improvements without uh, um, significant change in the network architecture, just changing these numbers. So this was 2013. 
And then another uh, revolution was happened using this BGGNet. So in 2014, uh, these guys, uh, Andrew Zizerman is really famous, actually the father of computer vision. Uh, he's a faculty of uh, University of Oxford and is also working for Google DeepMind. And he's, he, we are going to see his paper a lot of uh, time during this course. So this is uh, one of the, his great uh, work on image understanding. Um, he applied some new techniques uh, and applied uh, much deeper neural networks, which is nine, uh, 19 layers here. So we are going to see what was that uh, now. So uh, what is the main difference from AlexNet? They applied only three by three con filters uh, instead of 11 by 11 or five by five or seven by seven. Why? So that's the main contribution of this paper. And thanks to that, actually, they were able to use much deeper architecture from eight layers to 16 or 19 layers. Here, uh, I'm going to um, remind you that how to count the number of layers. Because we don't have any uh, parameters to learn at the pooling layer, we don't count the pooling as a layer. We count only the layers with something to learn. So convolution and fully connected are only counted here. So at the AlexNet, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So we have only eight layers in the AlexNet. In this VGG 16 and 19, you can count these later. Uh, the 16 means they have 16 layers. 19, they have 19 layers. So, um, so yeah, let's talk about why they used only three by three. So if we stack two uh, three by three layers like this, the in the first layer, um, they will uh, each pixel will uh, each um, value will actually look at three by three uh, around that picture in, in the next layer. And if we stack those uh, three by three convolution layer twice, then that means each of these will uh, actually look at the three by three around that. From this, with these two layers, we can actually look at the five by five range uh, effectively. That is equivalent to use just single five by five convolutional layers in terms of the receptive field. We, we call this receptive field and um, if we use two stacks three by three, the receptive field is same as using just five by five single conv layer. You can just compare like that. That means if we stack n three by three conv, la conv layers, in the, for, for example, if we use three of these, then in the next layer, the receptive field will be increasing to seven by seven because each of these uh, edge layers will be looking at one more uh, pixels uh, outside of this. So it will be seven by seven. And we can generalize if we stack n of them, then the receptive field will be 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. So in this way, whatever the uh, larger um, convolutional layers, we can actually uh, change that to stacked n three by three conv layers. They can be, we can think of them uh, equivalent in terms of the receptive field. But why do we do this? So if we use, for example, one layer of seven by seven filters, the number of parameters is uh, roughly computed as like this. We have seven by seven filters, and uh, suppose we have the same number of channels in input and output, which is C here, then the input is seven by, uh, the number of filters is seven by seven times C, and we just ignore plus one here, the bias term. And in the output, we have C channels. So if we have just one single layer of seven by seven filters, the number of parameters is roughly 49 C square. But if we have three layers of three by three filters, then the uh, computation is like that. We have three times three, uh, ignore plus one here, and times C square. So it's 27, uh, we, because we have three of them, it's 27 uh, C square. So, Actually, using three layers of three by three filters is cheaper and lighter than using one single layer of seven by seven filters, even though we have the same receptive field. And this difference gets even more dramatic if we compare against larger filters like 11 by 11. Okay? So um, 
if we use just one single layer of larger filters, then uh, the number of receptive field increases with uh, n square. But uh, if we use multiple three by three, then it's uh, just linearly increasing to the, to the uh, receptive field size n. So this is the major difference. Uh, in one sentence, we can conclude that if we use stacked three by three layers instead of a single larger uh, filter size, we can actually reduce the number of parameters significantly, even though we can still have the same effective uh, receptive field. That's the main idea of this VGG net. So uh, this is the main change, uh, the major reason. But uh, we also have some minor um, uh, additional benefits. So with more layers, that means we have more uh, activation functions at the end of each layers. And that actually helps a little bit more to represent the non-linearities in the data set slightly better than uh, fewer of them. So uh, that's another benefit. So with this change, they have uh, they changes the uh, they removed all the five by five or eleven by eleven in the AlexNet, and they applied uh, instead of more three by three uh, count layers like this, they actually achieved much better results. So here's the uh, analysis of this model. So um, I'm not going to ask you this time, but um, you can practice this uh, later. So from the input layer, they have uh, the same size of image because they're using the same data sets. And then they apply twice of three by three count layers. So they named it uh, count one uh, dash one or one dash two. And then they uh, do the pooling. So uh, the size is uh, reduced by half. And then they another uh, applied another two uh, consecutive count layers, uh, and they actually doubled the uh, filter number of filters, and pulling, and then three count in a row, and then pulling three count pulling three count pulling. So it's similar to uh, AlexNet, but they applied three by three only, and more layers, uh, more count layers between the poolings. So that's the main change of this architecture. So. The, the output size is similar. At the end, they have seven by seven by uh, the number of channels. And we can here, we can compute the memory size and the number of parameters like this. Memory size means, given an image, you have to compute all of these intermediate results to have the final scores. So you can just simply com uh, compute uh, the number of values here. So in the input, we, have, we need these numbers to represent the input. And in the count layer, we need to compute all of these numbers, 224 times 224 times 64. So just simply compute all of these multiplied and adds. Then uh, the, the answer is like 96 megabytes we need to represent one image, uh, which means we, when you uh, feed one image and compute the all the scores, then we need some memory like that, which is huge, right? This is just a small, small image patch to 224 times 224. But uh, when you compute all of these, then for each image, we need one, almost 100 megabytes. So this is really memory heavy. And the number of parameters, this is uh, what we already have seen uh, in the previous examples. So the number of parameters are uh, computed based on the filter size. So they always use three by three and times input input uh, number of each, uh, channels. So at the beginning, it's three. And after that, the number of channels from the previous layer. So here is 64, 128, and so on. Oh, sorry, 64, and 128, and 256, and so on. And then multiplied by uh, the number of uh, output channels here, uh, right? We omit plus one for the bias term here for just rough computations. So um, they, we computed all the number of parameters here and sum all of them. Then we have 138 uh, million uh, parameters to learn in this model. One interesting thing is uh, the memory is mostly consumed in, at the beginning. At the, uh, at, in the end, we have fewer number of parameters. So at the beginning, uh, we need much more memory to represent. So, that's uh, one reason that actually we would like to do the pre-training. If we pre-train and just take the embedding from the pre-trained model, we can represent uh, the, each image using just very last uh, 4,000 numbers or seven by seven by uh, 500 or something instead of uh, these all the primitive features. 
But the number of parameters is the opposite. Most parameters are actually in the late uh, FC layers, not in the convolutional layers at the beginning. So later, we are going to see some other models that we would like to remove these uh, uh, fully connected layers in the end to reduce the number of parameters. So one question from Jun Hu. Is the amount of calculation for each layer similar when considering parallel computing? I think similar computational cost per layer benefits. Number of calculations for each layer, probably not similar because that probably the same as the, uh, uh, let's see. The number of computation per layer Uh, how should we define it? That's a good question, actually. Memory size is the, just the input size that we have to store in the memory. And the number of parameters are uh, what we need to learn. So either of these does not Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why. Uh, I'm, I know the GSDS internet is not as good as I expect. So I used my uh, phone to tethering, but uh, I don't know why this happens. Anyway, uh, I was answering the, uh, to Juno's question, which is uh, the amount of calculation for each layer. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, uh, either the memory or the number of parameters does not reflect in, in the amount of calculation. So you actually, you have to compute the number of flops in each layer. And you can actually try to compute that. But I'm not sure if they have considered that uh, when they designed these models. They actually, probably that was not the main consideration when they designed the, these models. So if you're interested in, please try to calculate it. And um, if we can optimize that, uh, probably that's useful. But um, the, the model accuracy is more, um, more of their interest to optimize, not the amount of computation, actually. Uh, another question. Do we have a memory space to store the parameters? I think there should be memory spaces, not just for images, but also parameters. Yes, we have to keep these in our memory. So that is actually the bottleneck to increase the batch size uh, too much. So we need the uh, GPU memory to uh, keep all of these. That's true. Is the total memory usage will be 96 times two, yes, considering the backward, plus, uh, so, uh, what is the 552, 138, ah, the number of parameters. But the number of parameters is not uh, for each image. That is shared for all the images, right? So the number of images is only multiplied to uh, 96 times two, not to this uh, 138. Right? Okay, uh, so here's some details about this VGGNet. Uh, they were winner of the ImageNet uh, competition in 2014. And um, so there are some points where they proposed two things, 19 layers and 16 layers, but um, the difference was actually just tiny. So some people just use uh, 16 layers uh, because it's more
Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Am I connected? <sighs> okay. This is really unreliable. Uh, okay, let's share the screen. Okay, can you hear me now? Do you hear me? Sorry, okay, cool. Yeah, I just reconnected. Uh, I hope this will not disconnect again. So I, yeah, I was just explaining the details of this VGG net and um, all of these you can uh, understand now what these are, uh, what these mean. And uh, please refer to the, their paper for more details. And let's move on to Google Nets, or they called uh, they are called Inception Network. So they were winner in 2014 uh, using the 22 layers with some interesting architectures here. So uh, they call um, they they actually devised some Inception module. Um, so here's the idea: they would like to apply some parallel filter operations with different sizes. We were using uh, same size of the filters always in each layer, but uh, the idea was what uh, the object we are going to uh, detect in the image may be in the different sizes. So if we just apply the same uh, size of filters all the time, then uh, each of those different size of objects should be uh, detected in different layers, and it's hard to optimize uh, what would be the target size. So they actually try to have multiple filter sizes at each layer, and they stack these um, modules uh, in a deeper way. So all of these filter ops are concatenated to uh, actually each of these filters act will detect different size of the objects in each layer, and they are all concatenated uh, to um, provide that information to the next layer, and they uh, they are stacked. Um, in a row, so that we can actually each of those um, different size objects will be will follow different uh, routes to be detected in, to be most e uh, e uh, efficiently. So the name the network was named with Inception because around the time the the movie Inception was famous and uh, there was was uh, some meme like uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio says we need to go deeper. And because they were trying to make the model more deeper, they just named as Inception. So why uh, do we do that? The multi-resolution feature extractions at all levels, uh, and so it provides some more flexibility and better performance overall. So uh, here's the problem, though. Uh, initially, they would like to just uh, apply these different sizes of the filters at each layer. And uh, that actually, they realized that that actually causes some computational complexity problem. So suppose they have input size of 28 by 28 by 256, for example. And then this is the output size after each of these layers. So one by one count, uh, suppose we have the same size padding. Uh, one by one count, they have the same size times the number of filters. Three by three, uh, because they assume the same size padding, the output size is the same, and the number of filters are like this, okay? And then they concatenate these. So each of those pixels, uh, the number of channels are summed to this. So overall, they have 28 by 28 by 672, and this is the number of parameters they are learning. Here, we are omitting the uh, bias again for um, just rough computation. So um, this is too much. Uh, let's see why. The number of convolution operators here, starting from uh, this input, they go to this one by one conf. So 
the uh, number of con conversion operations is 1 by 1 by 256 times 128 channels here. And they have to output in all 28 by 28 uh, output pixels. So each 28 by 28 output pixels, they apply one by one con. And the number of channels in the input is 256. And they have 128 of them. Okay. And the, in the second thing, they have uh, three by three conv here. So the um, in the output, they have 28 by 28 pixels. And they have 192 of them uh, in the channels. And each of them, they compute 3 by 3 by 256 uh, input filters, applied these, the, uh, this size of filters in each output pixels. And they have to compute all the uh, inner products with this, this size. So yeah, this may be um, not very straightforward. So if, you, if you're not uh, following this right now, maybe you have to review this uh, later. So anyway. The number of entire convolution operations in this layer total is 805,4 million, 54 million operations, which is a lot. So how can we reduce this? So uh, here we uh, apply the one by one convolutions to reduce the uh, channel size to dimension reduction. That's what we briefly discussed in lecture five when I introduced one by one con for the first time. So suppose we have uh, an image of uh, the filters of size 128 times 128 pixels times 64 channels. And we would like to reduce it to same size of image, but the number of channels, half of them. And if we apply one by one conf, what, what does that? For each of these pixels, because this is one by one conf, we don't use the nearby pixels. So each of these output will be just computed using the values in the exactly the same pixel. So suppose for this one, uh, we have 64 numbers in these pixels. And then we apply the fully connected layer to output half size of that. So for each pixel, we apply one by one by uh, 64. This is just a vector of 64 numbers. And we apply some fully connected layer to have three, uh, 32 output numbers. And that is performed in all uh, location of the pixels independently. OK? So here, uh, each pixel performs 64 dimensional dot products uh, to have each of these values in the output pixel. And we have uh, 32 of them. So this is basically the fully connected layer. So overall, we can see this as a dimension reduction, mixing the information in different, pix uh, different channels on the same pixel to have um, some mixed but more compact representation in, in, uh, in this output. OK, this is really important. So they are going to apply this to uh, the previous model like that to reduce the, the, uh, the, filter, the uh, number of parameters and uh, convolution operations significantly by just using this. Let's see how they, uh, they apply that. At the beginning, uh, we introduced this. And this is the output size we have computed for the original model. And here, they applied one by one convolution for these larger convolution layers. We don't have to repeat the same thing in the one by one con because this is already one by one. But three by three, before we apply three by three con, we reduce the input size from uh, the image size times 256 to 64. We re just reduce dimension reduction. Uh, on the, the input side. And we apply the same thing to this 5 by five, 5, five, 5 conf. So in, the input size is uh, 64. The channel uh, is 64 channels instead of 256. We reduce that to 1 fourth. And for 3 by 3 max pooling, uh, we apply the 1 by 1 conf after that, because this is just deterministic function. We apply the 3 by 3 max pooling first. And then we apply uh, the dimension reduction from 256 to 64 here. So what is the effect of that? Let's uh, calculate the effect of this. Input size is the same. And then output size is, uh, after this one by one con, we have 
28 by 28 by 64 instead of 256. And here it doesn't change because we apply the same 3 by 3 max cooling. And after that, this, the output size is the same, right? Except for this. Uh, after the 1 by 1 count, we have 64 here. In total, just the change is here. Uh, the output size is the same for all of these count layers. And only the 1 by 1 count, uh, uh, the 3 by 3 max pooling part, we have 64. So total number of output size is just slightly dropped. It's about like 2 thirds from uh, the input. Maybe that looks not like a big deal, right? But uh, when you compare the number of conversion operations, actually that significantly drops from 800 to 200, right? So let's compute that, what, uh, what happens here. Now we are applying one by one conf, uh, three of them additionally. So these three things are new uh, computations. So one by one by 256, uh, that is applied to the input. So each, the convolutional layer uh, size is one by one, the filter is one by one, and the input channel is 256. So this is the input side. And we output 64 channels, and we apply to uh, all the output values 28 by 28. So that's uh, how we computed the number of computations in each of, uh, these, each of these one by one convolution layers. So these are all equal, equal size, right? And then uh, we are paying this, but now we are actually getting a lot of reduction in the existing layers. So this part doesn't change because we didn't add anything. But here, three by three conf, we originally had, uh, we originally had, uh, Three by three, uh, let's see. Yeah, we originally had 256 here, but now we have to 64 of them as the input. So we reduced the 256 to 64. So input is reduced to three by three by 64, and the output is the same. And here uh, we also reduced the 256 to 64. So the amount of this, this part reduced to 25%. But that is actually the most expensive part of this network. So by reducing the computation here to one fourth, uh, the amount of um, computation is almost like one third or one fourth, something between that. So reducing the dimensionality of these input to larger convolution size uh, actually significantly reduces the number of con uh, convolution operators. And uh, based on that, um, actually they were able to train on a uh, large data set more efficiently. So this is just the main idea of the Google Nets. And uh, there are some other uh, ideas they applied. So uh, in the previous model, the VGG, we have seen that um, the number of parameters are exploding at the end of the network when we apply the fully connected layers. Because the 4,000 times 4,000, we have like uh, 16 million parameters Um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, we need some solution for this. Uh, okay, anyway. So yeah, I was talking about some other ideas here. So um, it, at VGG, we have seen that uh, the, most comp the most number of parameters were happening at the end of the network because of the uh, uh, fully connected layers, 4,000 times 4,000, which is like 16 millions. So they try to remove all of those fully connected layers as much as possible. So here, they applied um, after that. Uh, in the in the end, they will have some output features like this shape, uh, similar to previous ones, seven by seven by channels. Then they apply just average pooling for each pixel. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the for each channel. So each channel they have uh, forty nine numbers. 
but they uh, apply the average pooling to reduce it to uh, one by one. So each different locations, they have different values. And in the end, they are averaged. And then uh, they apply only one of the con uh, fully connected layers to uh, map it to 1,000 class scores. That is unavoidable. So uh, they have only one fully connected layer in the end, uh, mapping from one, one by one by C, which is like 1,000 or 500, something like that, to map it to 1,000 scores. So only there they have the fully connected layers, but all other layers, they don't have that. So here, uh, this is the overall architecture. So each of these module is the inception layer we have seen so far. So here in the, uh, at the beginning, the input is given here and uh, they, they are fed into something called STEM network, which is uh, they didn't uh, change this. Uh, actually they are in the older style like the VGG or the AlexNet. So at the very beginning, we have learned that the, the neural networks learn very, very primitive features like the edges or the color changes. Remember that? So that part is not uh, sub, uh, not be able to substitute it with these uh, advanced layers. They, they just realized that actually we need to first detect those very primitive features. So uh, something called STEM network is just con pool, con con pool, which is like AlexNet style. They just keep as is. And after that, everything is changed to these inception layers. So each of these are stacked inception modules. Uh, we have nine of them, right? And in the end, they have just classifier, as we see. Uh, um, they just took the average pooling uh, for each location, and then they map it to softmax. So this is it. And you may have uh, observed that they ha have these uh, classification network is in the middle. So these are auxiliary classification outputs. Uh, so uh, without using three layers in the end here, actually they use just these six layers using the intermediate features to classify the, the image. And uh, they compute the, the loss here and it's uh, updated through this pass, uh, ignoring the later parts. Why they want to do that? We have seen that the gradients uh, get slower, uh, get smaller and smaller once we uh, uh, go through the uh, activation functions. Uh, even though they don't use the sigmoid, still uh, there are some issues uh, when the model gets too deep. So uh, the gradients maybe gets too lower if we have only the gradients uh, computation at, in the end. So they add it in the middle, but later uh, they realize that that's not really necessary. So this model was the winner of the ImageNet competition in 2014, and they applied 22 uh, layers, and they actually introduced nine inception modules, uh, which is uh, very different from what they have done previously, and uh, improved efficiency uh, by using the inception module plus one by one convolutions. And they removed all the fully connected layers so this model is like 12 times lighter and 27 times lighter than the previous uh, top models, which is much, much lighter. So you may refer to this paper for more details. And they honestly mentioned that uh, they don't know the best hyperparameters. They just used some default values. Uh, they just left it as a uh, future work or others work. Okay, uh, let's move on to ResNet. ResNet is uh, the winner of this competition in 2015. And the number of layers was uh, explosively increased from 12, uh, 22 layers to like 152 layers. So ResNet is still widely used these days. And this is actually the first model that uh, surpasses the human's ability to recognize an image, uh, which is we measured like 5% in, in this paper. So. Starting at 2015, the machine uh, learned, machine learned uh, software is actually outperforming human in image recognition. So let's see what they have done here. We always say that um, go deeper, go deeper. We have, if we have deeper models, then the performance gets better. That was always people were saying around that time. But is it really true? Yes, in theory. So here's the uh, arguments. Suppose uh, a shallower model called f can uh, represent some function. Uh, then 
if we have twice larger model than that, then it should be able to represent exactly the same thing. So uh, suppose that um, some function is represented by this model uh, called f. Then if we have twice larger model like that, then we should be able to find this um, trivial solution that just ignoring the half of them using just identity function. And then gx is same as fx, then the performance should be the same. And if this part can be used uh, in, in, in some better way, then the performance should be getting better. Otherwise, this should be the same. So the, the guess was like this, that uh, if the deeper model, uh, if we use the deeper model, then the performance should be at least uh, same as uh, using the shallower model. So that was our conjecture. But in reality, uh, people observed that that's not the case. They just trained uh, shallower model and the deeper model, but they realized that uh, it's harder to optimize the, uh, the deeper model as, as seen in this uh, experiment. Why? Maybe we can ask if this is overfitting, but it's not because this is, uh, they also tested uh, on the evaluation error when that was not overfitting and that actually was increasing, uh, the decreasing as well. So it's not an overfitting, then why? Why should we uh, have worse results with a better model or deeper model? So their hypothesis was this. They have still some capacity to represent uh, more complex uh, patterns, but deeper models are just harder to optimize or harder to train. So they still have the capacity to represent as we just seen, but uh, just um, deeper model is just harder to optimize. And Vanishing gradient problem was one uh, hint for that because the gradient is uh, reduced uh, if, if that's just happening in the end. And because we have two deeper mo deep models, those gradients are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And then in the earlier layers, it's not almost updated. So something similar to that might be happening. So that was their hypothesis. So how can we avoid that? Uh, that is the key idea of this ResNet. The ResNet means residual network. So uh, they just simply added some uh, shortcuts to skip just one or more layers. Previously, we just stacked all the layers all the time. And we had to go through, everything go, has to go through layer by layer or floor by floor. But uh, they added one identity function crossing some of those layers. So why does that help? So the input axis, uh, always add it to the output and the layers are uh, to fit the residual. So if, because this uh, input, the same value is always added to the output like that, uh, this is kind of default. It, uh, the, X, uh, the identity function, they don't have to represent. That's just basically uh, um, given. And then what they have to model using these weight layers are uh, hx minus x. hx is here and x is here. So if they have something to model, then uh, the difference between hx and x should be modeled using these weight layers. Not uh, without this, then they have to um, represent hx itself. But now x and hx are um, the, only the difference needs to be modeled. So if we have very deep model, then in the end, uh, x and hx will be already similar because uh, we used up all the capacity and now we are kind of already representing the, the desired patterns already. And then there is nothing left to additionally model using these weight layers. And then HX and X will be very similar and these weight layers will be almost zero. That should be okay because we, are, uh, we already have this identity mapping. So we can more safely increase the number of layers and just let the model to use as much as it needs. And then unused ones just uh, will be ignored. So that's very simple, but very brilliant idea. So they just safely increased the number of layers from 22 to like 152. And all others are actually very similar to Google Net. So each residual blocks has only three by three conf, which was the idea of the VGG. And uh, they periodically double the number of filters and downsample especially using STRI2, which is same as AlexNet or uh, ZFNet or the, all the previous models. And 
stem conf layers at the beginning, same as Google Net. We have seen that, this part, 7x7 seven seven conf, they just use this at the stem network. No additional FC layers in the end. Uh, we explained this in inception to Google Net. So the main idea of ResNet is just having these skip connections. But here, they also take some uh, ideas from the uh, Google Net to reduce the computation. So because they have two deep layers, uh, a bottleneck layer is useful to improve the efficiency. So here, the bottleneck means one by one conf. So same as what we've done in uh, Google Net. Given the input size of this, 256, they apply one by one conf first to apply some dimension reduction. Same as the Google Net, right? From 256, we reduce it to 64. And then they apply the three by three convolutions here using only the uh, 64 feature maps. And then they apply the batch norm and then one by one convo gain to move it back to 256. Because they are adding these directly, the number of dimensions should be the same. Otherwise, we cannot add them, right? So they just project back to the original space and just reduce the computation happening inside using the three by three con. Similar idea to Google Net here. So here are summarizations. Uh, they were the first results, which is better than the human, as I mentioned. And they have multiple versions from 18 to 152. So probably you are going to use this model in your project to uh, uh, extract the image features. And you may choose the right number of layers. Uh, actually, in homework two, you are going to experience uh, using this ResNet 50 uh, to uh, initialize your model. Uh, we have just a few more slides. So let's try to finish that. So Inception, after the uh, Google Net, they uh, introduced additional versions like version 2, 3, and 4. So Inception version 2 and 3 were introduced in the same paper. And uh, the main idea was applying the uh, IDD of the VGG. So instead of 5 by 5 or larger um, conf, they can uh, exchange it to 3 by 3, uh, more than one 3 by 3 conf layers, just that. So this 5 by 5 is changed to 3 by 3 in the inception module. That's just the main idea. And after that, they applied uh, even more uh, reduction by uh, reducing this to 1 times 3 and 3 times 1. So still, you can, you can verify this. Um, 1 by 3 and 3 by 1, they have still the same uh, receptive field as 3 by 3. You can verify that in your head. So all of these 3 by 3 is uh, kind of factorized to 1 by 3 and 3 by 1. And uh, in this way, uh, as in the same manner, from 5 to 5 to 3 by 3, they can still uh, keep the same um, receptive field, but uh, the number of parameters are actually reduced. So you're going to see this example many times in, uh, in the rest of this course. And here, they applied another idea of uh, grid size reduction. So uh, here's their um, consideration. From the pooling to inception like this, so given this image size, if they apply the pooling first and then inception, then uh, once they uh, apply the pooling, then the image size reduced by half, and then they apply inception. So in this case, the information is lost. And Another way, if they apply the inception first and the pooling later, then this inception part is too expensive. So what would be their solution? They try to do multiple things to uh, trade off these two extremes. So they applied um, in, in the same image, they applied the half convolution and half pooling like this. So the pooling part is still the same, uh, pooling with try two, and then they have uh, the same channel size, but the image size reduced to 17 by 17. And for the convolution part, they reduce it to um, uh, one by one con first, and then uh, apply three by three, stride one and stride two. And here is stride two only. And summing these, uh, the number of channels is fit to 320. So 
you may refer to the paper for more details, but the main idea is just uh, trying to find something uh, in between these two extremes, but still they have the same input and output size. But uh, the computational overhead and the information loss is uh, kind of trade off between these two. And after that, they uh, published Inception V4 paper, and that is actually taking the idea from the ResNet. So on the Inception modules, they applied the residual connection or skip connection like this, and they uh, mentioned that they can like in increase the uh, improve the performance a lot by this. So taking the ideas from uh, different models, they were able to achieve better performance. And uh, this figure actually compares the performance and computational overhead at the same time. So you see that the inception before uh, performed the best on this data set. And uh, VGG was heavier side like that. And uh, the lighter model was the Google Net. So Google Net was kind of the most efficient model. And their uh, Inception V4, which is the combination of the Google Net and the ResNet, they actually performed uh, the best. So this is just a summary. And in this survey paper, um, there is a summary of these models and the history and some uh, additional models are explained. So if you're interested in, I'd like to uh, ask you to read the paper. And there were more recent works like ResNext, DenseNet, or Mo MobileNet. Um, DenseNet, maybe uh, you can also consider this model as your baseline for, um, uh, for your projects. And in the last semester, some students used DenseNet as their uh, pre-trained model, even though we didn't cover this. So this is not really hard, actually. Just uh, they connect all the, all the possible pairs in, within some block. Uh, densely instead of just having one uh, skip connections. And that's it. So uh, you should be able to uh, understand the paper easily if you already understand uh, the ResNet. So this is the end of chapter eight. Um, so yeah, to finish, um, we announced the midterm and uh, homework two will be out today. And the project is already starting. So yeah, because we don't have time, I'm going to um, record what I expect for your midterm reports. And please report to that before you start. And OK, so this, today's lecture is done. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me now.